हेलो गाइस टुडे वी विल बी लर्निंग हाउ टू टेक योर हिस्ट्री एंड एग्जामिनेशन फॉर स्टमक केस एंड इन पर्टिकुलरली विल बी डीलिंग अबाउट कैंसर्स ऑफ स्टमक एंड पैप्टिक अल्सर डिजीज सो दिस इज द सेकेंड वीडियो रिलेटेड टू एबडमन इन द जी आई केस एज आई ऑलरेडी टोल्ड यू इन माई प्रीवियस वीडियो एंड नेक्स्ट वीडियो विल बी ऑन राइट इलेक् फो समास विच विल बी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वीडियो फॉर योर जी आई सो बिफोर मूविंग ए हैड आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक ऑल दिस पीपल हु हैव बीन माई कॉन्स्टेंट सोर्स ऑफ लर्निंग एंड एनकरेजमेंट स्पेशली अवर पेशेंट्स हु टीच अस अ लॉट इन दिस प्रोफेशन सो moving ahead before that i'd just like to uh, you guys to have a brief idea regarding what we going to deal in this one is the stomach cancer for this you can learn the stomach as the mnemonic because most of the time they will be silent means they will not have much of the problem and they will present only in the late stage or in the secondary or where metastasis has happened they will there might be a mass when they present they will have obstruction obstruction will cause also obstruction of the gi tract which will cause pain also late and they will have mass or melina i already told anemia and asthenia cachexia and constipation because constipation because of obstruction and hematemesis so if you look at the general profile of uh, carcinoma stomach mostly they will be 60 years old male with epigastric pain and some early symptom of stomach cancer are generally like indigestion vague discomfort sensation of fullness or heaviness after meal loss of appetite feeling weak pain appears at the later stage in the stomach cancer where else when we look at same obstruction of the gi tract what we call as gastric outlet outlet obstruction which we call it in short as goo so this gastric outlet obstruction could be due to uh, your peptic ulcer disease so in peptic ulcer disease uh, there will be stasis of food there will be no mass peptic ulcer disease encompasses of both the thing your duodenal ulcer or your gastric ulcer in the upcoming slides we'll be dealing in detail they will uh, in if it is a gastric ulcer uh, they won't eat much there will be frequent vomiting if there is obstruction due to the peptic ulcer disease uh, because after the chronic gastric ulcer is there they can uh, obstruct the our gastric outlet they will have like food will stay and within 12 hours or uh, they will vomit it out after if there is a obstruction of the gi tract and vomiting uh, like whatever they eat in the morning that will come out in the evening so the duration is within 12 hours but not more than 24 hours if there is a gastric outlet obstruction due to the <laughs> peptic ulcer disease and there are no free days without vomiting so there's just a general uh, difference between if it is gastric outlet obstruction due to the peptic ulcer disease or carcinoma of stomach one of the most common question which might they ask you in your why why is what are the peripheral manifestation of malignancies related to gi and colon so of the gastro gastrointestinal tract so basically it could be virtuous left node means there would be a supra left supraclavicular lymph node enlargement there could be irish node left axillary lymph node will be palpable there could be migratory thromboplebitis this i have already explained in the previous video of obstructive jaundice there could be erythema there could be acanthosis nigricans most common site is uh, your nape of neck or axilla and could be related most commonly seen in uh, diverticulum related malignancy there could be sister mary joseph nodule which will be talking in this video there could be recto vesical deposits there could be meths to the liver which will cause ascites now this is the most important slide which will help you to understand the whole topic one of the common skill which everyone must have is how to differentiate whether it is a gastric ulcer or a duodenal ulcer so duodenal ulcer when we are talking about is that duodenal ulcer the most common site for duodenal ulcer is your first part of the duodenum this is the most common first site so when we see and this part is also called duodenal point and in the next slide i will also tell you how to look at the duodenal point tenderness and during the examination when we uh, look the duodenal ulcers are common in youngers 
it is very common duodenal ulcer is very much common compared to the gastric ulcer pain is relieved by food this is what they have hunger food uh, because when you understand the etiology of why duodenal ulcer occur duodenal ulcer is due to higher secretion of uh, gastric acids in the stomach when there is a higher gastric acids in the stomach that will come down to the duodenum and that will increase or cause your duodenal ulcer while your gastric ulcers happens due to the defective gastric mucosa uh, as the person eats spicy food or alcohol then it causes acute gastritis pain and when the person vomits out the food because then he feels relief so a guest person with a gastric ulcer will vomit out a lot so he will be thin they will be vomiting after the meals there will be tenderness at the epigastric point there will be more melina melina is when there is a blood with scl your hydrochloric acid of your stomach that causes melina is more common than hematemesis and site this is also very important viva question which site which curvature of the stomach you will find uh, your gastric ulcer is common so that is the lesser curvature and uh, because this is adjacent to the acid secreting cells called parietal cells and mostly the ulcers which is related to the smaller curvature lesser curvature is benign if at all there is a gastric ulcer toward the greater curvature of the stomach most commonly it could be malignant so and that's why also malignancy there are higher chances of gastric ulcers to be more malignant compared to your duodenal dun- ulcers really will turn up into any malignancies in duodenal ulcers when the because the pain is due to the higher gastric gas uh, gastric acid secretion when the person eats the acids gets neutralized then the person feel good so generally duodenal ulcer people will keep habit of keep on munching and they will gain the weight they will be little obese so this this is the midline of the body and these these are the mid clavicular line this is your transpyloric line so one at this junction of the your midline and the transpyloric line 1 inch or approx 2.5 cm to the right of the midline in the transpyloric point here this point is your duodenal point when we press on it there will be a duodenal uh, tenderness hematemesis is more common and most common side is the first 2.5 cm or the first part of the duodenum and rarely malignant so overall pep- these both are your peptic ulcer disease and it is uh, very rarely before th- 15 years of age very rarely mostly in adults and both will present with epigastric pain with the patient you won't be able to get to know it's a duodenal side or this but it will be epigastric pain and for both of them the risk factor is taking painkillers which is nsaids or any smoking spicy food alcohol duodenal ulcer is due to the hyperacidity i already told hyperacidity could be there of the stomach which affects the duodenum hyperacidity is due to the vagus stimulation which can be also due to your the spicy food it's due to nsai due to h pylori duodenal ulcer pain in m happens in early morning or empty stomach i'm because the hunger pain gastric ulcer pain uh, occurs after the meals this is very important differentiating point which you should remember so now let's start our history taking which is very important part so basically you will be asking the age and gastric carcinomas are higher in older people there will be high chances of gastric carcinoma due in the young people there will be duodenal ulcers i already told infants if you see related to just to as a part of gi can have the hiatus hernia newborn if you look at the newborn newborn can have congenital pyloric stenosis and mostly it happens in the first male babies and peptic ulcer disease when we look at the gender and the gender it's more common in males compared to females your peptic ulcer disease and females have higher chance of gallstone which i already told you in obstructive jaundice uh, certain occupation people are habituated to take higher caffeine or tea consumption so that happens like if someone is a businessman is or a conduct bus conductor or is a clerk they keep on having excess tea or caffeine or certain people who have uh, excess smoking 
so that thing you should know and also in a general like gallbladder stone is common in the in the eastern part of the country or in the northern part while in the southern part of our country or you know, the south india peptic ulcer disease is higher little common because of higher spicy intake then you have to ask the chief complaint pain at abdomen or you can also mention it as as upper abdomen or the lower abdomen if the whatever patient is able to tell mention the chief complaint in patient's language and for how many days of vomiting or something and then present in a chronological order this is all you have to remember then comes to your history of presenting illness you have to start patient was apparently well this many days when he started having pain at this this or vomiting and then elaborate each of the symptom so basically with the pain you have to mention the site duration whether it is continuous or intermittent uh, because that will help you to also differentiate duodenal or gastric whether it is the pain is what type of the nature of the pain it's dull aching or burning whether there is any radiation to back radiation to back i already told it could be related to pancreas relation right hypochondrium pain radiating to the right shoulder could be related to gallbladder the left hypochondrium pain radiating to the left shoulder could be due to your spleen and then you have to ask about aggravating factor tea spicy food or any analgesic like any side relieving factor could be vomiting in case of gastric ulcer or antacids like eno or anything whatever they take so peptic ulcer disease in common is if you look at the peptic ulcer disease they will complain of burning sensation of the at the epigastric and it might radiate to the sternal part that's why it's also called as as heartburn most of the time heartburn is typically a feature of gastroesophageal reflux disease in which there is a faulty lower esophageal sphincter which results in uh the backlash of uh, gastric acid and the content uh, towards the esophagus which causes burning sensation and especially regurgitation of food or sour liquid in the mouth and the person uh, it especially happens when the person lies down or especially at night there might be also difficulty uh, some trouble in swallowing or some sensation in the throat so uh the you in hindi generally we in the history we ask like whether there is a khatti dakar if it is there then you can suspect gert if the pain is continuous then you have to suspect of uh, some gastric carcinoma or uh, of the stomach or there is something related to pancreas and peptic ulcer disease uh, will be also very seasonal it's more common in autumn and winter or when the person take less water because water is alkaline if the even if the person with a, a peptic ulcer disease takes a water water is alkaline a little bit alkaline and reduces the pain pain in gastric uh, ulcer uh, or in malignancy due to the obstruction of the gi tract which could be due to the food stasis or it could be due to the liver mets or it could be infiltration to the pancreas that time pain will occur then uh, you have to mention about the vomiting what is the character is projectile or non projectile content whether it is bile stain or associated with blood associated blood means some bleeding is happening in the in the body bile means because if it is coming with the bile it means it is at the the obstruction is below the second part of the duodenum where the bile duct is open then uh, you have to look at the duration since when the patient is having how many episode he had frequent or constant uh, frequent and constant it could be due to uh, intestinal obstruction or periodical relationship with pain whether the pain precedes the vomiting whether pain happened before and then person has a vomiting it could be due to an acute appendicitis pancreatitis peptic ulcer biliary or renal colic pain where there is a stone in kidney or in the gallbladder whether both happen simultaneously it's more common in the high intestinal obstruction or at the stomach or the duodenal level when the vomiting relieves the pain it could be due to the peptic ulcer so vomiting is constant in case of pyloric obstruction and gastritis and really in duodenal ulcer it may be with the gi obstruction and 
Vomiting can also occur. You have to mention, uh, remember the other causes of vomiting. It could be also with the gallbladder disease or pancreas. Projectile, uh, most of the time they might ask you what is projectile vomiting. Projectile vomiting is involuntary, forceful ejection of the large quantity of the vomitus. It is seen in your intestinal obstruction, seen in toxic enteritis. In case of uh, peptic ulcer perforation or general peritonitis, vomiti, vomiting is quite of non-projectile which is quite regurgitation of the mouthfuls. In intestinal obstruction, where if there is any obstruction, first the content of the stomach will come out, then the second part where the biliary opening is there, bilious part. If and if there is obstruction of just lower part, then the feculent content means stool might come out. Three cardinal sign of intestinal obstructions are your intestinal colic pain plus vomiting plus distance distension of the abdomen so these three is there you can understand you can think there is an intestinal obstruction in case of peptic ulcer disease the content will be only whatever the person ate the gastric content in case of perforation there will be no vomiting vomiting won't be there in case if any perforation has happened because if if this is a larger curvature and this is a smaller curvature if there is any perforation all the food will go to the abdominal cavity and there will be no vomiting nausea generally huh, with with the history of vomiting you have to also ask the history of nausea nausea is an early sign of chronic appendicitis i already told in case of pancreatitis and even in gastric carcinoma uh, they might ask you what color was the vomiting if it is coffee colored it means hemorrhage it means whether there is HCL plus some blood is there that will result into coffee colored vomiting it happens in hemorrhage due to gastric ulcer or stomach cancer acidic vomiting the person feels like little bit of burning sensation and all happens in duodenal ulcer biliary vomiting due to cholelithiasis or intestinal obstruction below the second part of the duodenum projectile or copious vomiting where the undigested food particles come in pyloric stenosis so then you have to ask about the history of other things whether hematemesis is there or not hematemesis versus hemoptysis you should know the difference between both hemoptysis hemoptysis is blood in sputum and hematemesis is blood in vomiting so this both difference you should know hematemesis is more common in posteriorly situated ulcers where perforation is more common and hematemesis can also occur in multiple erosions esophageal varicel where there is a bleeding in the carcinoma of stomach malaria v syndrome this itself is a viva question you have to read hemophilia whether there is a higher more prone for bleeding tolerance to solid food is there or not if uh, how much it is partial or complete but if a person cannot tolerate solid but tolerate liquid it shows you there is a partial obstruction of the GI because liquid is able to pass in the obstruction so this is a partially obstructed if a person is not able to tolerate neither solid nor liquid then the higher chances there is a complete obstruction that time you the person will also give that he is not even passing um, the gas like flatus is also not there so it means there is a complete higher chances of obstruction history of melina is there or not black or terry stools which are melina means blood plus your gastric acid is there that's why that is coming if that comes through the lower root uh, with the stool it, uh, it will be black and terry there is a history of ball rolling movements or not seen in the obstruction what happens is that when patient with gastric outlet obstruction or gastric carcinoma there is a lump in the abdomen uh, due to the mass or after taking the food and when there is a gastric peristalsis the person feel like that mass or that lump is moving in the abdomen as that thing is called as ball rolling movement there is history of loss of appetite which is early feature of carcinoma of stomach or any cancers but it is never seen in peptic ulcer disease
history of weight loss if significant weight loss is there which is more than 5% in 3 months then you can suspect of cancers past history uh, any nsaid or steroids because they cause higher gastritis or your peptic ulcer disease diabetes hypertension or any other illness history of any previous surgery especially this if there is any truncal vagotomy has been done it dis- predisposes a person for a gastric carcinoma person history you have to ask about how is the diet regular is regular is there they contain any spicy food uh, history of taking alcohol smoking any personal allergies history of peptic ulcer disease can run into the family history of any gi related disorder like crohn disease crohn disease ulcerative colitis diverticulitis carcinoma of the gastric tract then you can summarize this this we are old male or female presented with this type of pain at epigastric region for this many days or months pain aggravates with food reduces with the uh, vomiting and there is no weight weight loss so then history suggestive of gastric ulcer so like this you can make it for duodenal ulcer or any gastric carcinoma depending on what you get so just to promote my sex education book which i have written because in most of the medical students they lack basic sexual education i'm telling you it might look funny to you but i have seen i have interviewed lot of medical students i have seen in my own college of jipma aims also sex education is lacking in our country especially among among the medicos it's a free ebook you don't have to pay anything it's there freely available on your google books it's freely available on research gate i'll put on the la- options in the description box it's freely available in english it's freely available in hindi it's recently by mentex uh, and you in kerala they have translated into malayalam so and it's freely available in your play store as a book and if anyone wants a hard copy because for printing if someone is more comfortable in reading hard copy of the book they can order it from the notion press you can use the coupon code as at sex education and you'll get a 25% off in the mrp so go for it read it and i'm definitely tell, telling you this is one of the important thing which are not told during mbbs and most of the people uh, lack this basic knowledge and they might feel they have a doctor tag but they might lack a basic knowledge on sex education which everyone must have it and even if not only for doctors if you want you can share with your friends who have any doubt related to sex education and all they can definitely go and app and read so also as you already know there are books question banks which i have written available on amazon kindle so coming up to the examination part which is also very important so definitely patient, you have to do the general examination and look and see how is the patient is built or nourished because a malnourished or undernourished patient you will see in case of gastric carcinoma a patient who is very lean and ha- having vomiting chronic and epigastric pain might be also of gastric ulcer because he loses most of the gastric content in vomiting and he feels good a person who is very fat or obese you can can give you hint toward duodenal ulcer because they have a habit of eating a person who has having glossitis which is shiny smooth reddish tongue can happen due to the poor nutrition and even poor nutrition that the person may have and in case of also in gi malignancy what happens is that intrinsic factor for vitamin b12 is produced by parietal cell and observe and absorbed in your body in terminal ileus so when there is a lacking of uh, intrinsic factor to bind vitamin b12 so that's why it will cause vitamin b12 deficiency and that will that's how it will the patient will have glossitis trosius sign i already told migratory thrombovirus in gml nancy then is your pickle pallor which could be seen in malignancy pure nutrition or in case of bleeding is there or some hemorrhage ectrus is there in case uh, you have missed out about anemia or pallor in your history then ask here and evaluate and add it in your history 
then is your uh, jaundice uh, generally uh, you can quantify jaundice people say it uh, at personal level i don't know how good it is but yeah if the examiners ask that time you can say you can quantify a little bit uh, generally it is greenish yellow which is 5 to 7 mg per deciliter you can suspect most common in cbd stone so this you can add into the previous video deep yellow they say it is it means it is the level is from 15 to 25 mg and if you are unable to confirm unable to confirm then think it is less than 3.5 mg and loss of appetite of upper GI malignancy will cause hypoalbuminemia which will cause pedal edema if other lymph node you are finding especially in the neck then you can also think of TB sinuses due to the lung disease or lung mats cardiac illness look at the pulse pulse is uh, very important especially in this BP pulse and respiratory pulse you can see pulse is nor can be normal in early stage of peptic perforation but later as soon this peptic ulcer disease will increase it will spread it will cause peritonitis in the abdomen that time pulse will increase pulse is also very important in case of your acute appendicitis or pain I'll tell you that in the next video so now coming to the very important part examination Take consent, expose the person from the level of uh, level of mid nipple to the mid thigh or at the level of saphenous opening. Patient should be lying f uh, flat with his leg extended in case of inspection and in case of palpation you have to flex the leg, flex the knee. You have to examine 9 quadrants, perineum, supraclavicular fossa and renal angle. At the inspection look at the skin whether there is er any erythma or not any sister joseph nodule which are deposits around the umbilicus what happens is there is a transcellomic spread and deposit of malignancy around the umbilicus from the stomach of carcinoma so that time it's a peripheral manifestation sister joseph nodule whether there is any scar if there is any scar is there it gives you a, a hint that there have been a previous history history of any surgery whether there is any dilated veins around the umbilicus then it will can give you history hint toward portal obstruction so this i'll tell you more in the abdomen examination video in of medicine umbilicus whether it is in midline or upward displayed what happens there is something called tenol sign due to the ascites umbilicus will be shifted upward if there is a pelvic swelling or reverted and umbilicus will be tucked in in case of obesity it would be averted in case of ascites and tucked in in case of obesity so this is also one of the ex most common question in the exam uh, look at the contour of the abdomen whether the normal contour of the abdomen is not retracted nor distended it would be retracted or scaphoid in thin wasted patient or in case of malignancy uh, in case of malignancy patient may also have ascites so that time it will be distended again already told you the five F's of the abdomen in the abdomen you have to look for the abdomen any pulsation is there or not for us looking at the abdomen pulsation you can ask the patient to hold the breath at the end of expiration for two three five seconds and that time you can well appreciate any pulsation this abdomen pulsation you will find mainly in case of aortic aneurysm or any tumor in front of abdominal aorta at that time you can also find an epigastric swelling could be also due to the mass like stomach ma stomach carcinoma i have already told you it could be also due to uh, if the gallbladder is too much of enlarged then that mother time also it might come your pancreatic mass can also present as an epigastric swelling this all details we will uh, see in later on any movement with respiration is there or not uh, because whenever like for example if the gallbladder is inflamed then you can see there is a localized limitation of that that area will be less mobile compared to the other areas if same happens in case of appendicitis also we we'll look at the hernial orifice renal angle perineum and look for any visible gastric peristalsis it is generally seen when you ask the patient to drink one liter of water and then 
make the patient to lie down and then look at tangent tangentially seen near the epigastric region or near the umbilical uh, uh, um, at the umbilical region from left to right generally it will be from left to right so that would be your gastric peristalsis if it is from right to left if the movement of the peristalsis is from uh, right to left then you can think of it is a transverse colon movement if the movement is from left to right think of gastric peristalsis peristalsis of small intestine is seen as in ladder pattern and especially in the central abdomen which shows lymph node will be enlarged in case of gastric malignancies especially uh, GI malignancy especially in the gastric carcinoma this is virtuous node so which is the virtuous node so if you look at the upper uh, sub left supraclavicular region so the, here the lymph nodes are also divided into three groups medial middle and the lateral part so the medial part of the supraclavicular lymph node groups is called as your virtuous lymph node and when it is enlarged in the left side left supraclavicular region that time you call it as trousier sign whenever you talk about virtuous lymph node uh, most of the examiners will ask you okay what are the differential diagnosis of the left uh, supraclavicular lymph node that is another very common question so that time you have to say any malignancy related to gi especially gastric carcinoma carcinoma of pancreas or colon left-sided breast malignancies will also go to the virtuous lymph node or the left supraclavical lymph nodes left-sided breast um, breast malignancy will also go to the left supraclavicular lymph node peritoneum malignancy or malignancies originating from left ovary or testis let's now moving ahead to the palpation in the palpation you can give a pillow to a patient to keep his below uh, his head ask the patient to flex his hip so the abdomen muscles are relaxed relax and uh, warm your hands engage patient in conversation and that time you can do the superficial where you look for the warmth and tenderness tenderness always look at the wince whether the patient is wincing or not or whether there is any guarding or rigidity relax the patient ask the patient to deep breathe before with mouth even if the patient is not relaxing then you ask the patient to take the deep breaths through mouth and uh, start palpation from this farthest point for superficial uh, palpation you can use the flexor surface of the finger with the light pressure for the deep you have to use the volar surface of your finger and uh, more pressure in each expiration is given and try to palpate for liver and spleen you can also use double hand technique for the deep palpation use upper hand for the pressure and the lower hand for feeling the organ so the deep palpation in children uh, in child you can palpate his abdomen with his his or her own hand to palpate for the deep palpation uh, for muscle guarding over the upper half of the right rectus muscle in the patient who is seized with sudden sudden pain over the same reason is suggestive of perforation of peptic ulcer guarding due to the thoracic disease will be due to diminished uh, will be diminished when patient is asked to take deep breath or out through the mouth so when you expiration you will see guarding of the thoracic disease will be diminished as soon the patient take the knee is something called nicolson maneuver what happens is you exert the pressure pressure on the lower sternum with palm and uh, during this method you will stop the thoracic movement uh, to start and the patient will have abdominal breathing and that time when the patient inspire this or organ will touch your fingers that will make very easy to palpate the abdominal organs to identify the duodenal point what you can also do is you can ask the patient to keep his one hand below at the ziphoid process and just one hand below and in the midline one inch toward the right is your duodenal point so here is one video which the patient already has a right hypochondriac scar which also gives you a history that the patient has already gone, undergone cholecystectomy this is a very classical scar of cholecystectomy now in this video you can see as soon i press the duodenal point the patient will wince and that shows a very classical sign of duodenal tenderness you can hear the sound as so that gives the there is a wincing the patient's complain of pain when i pressed the epigastric region there was no complain of pain as soon as i shift to the 
uh, duodenal point, the patient complains of pain. So, in case of gastric carcinomas, mostly you will find uh, abdominal swelling, and for the abdominal swelling, there is very common test uh, which are done is is the Carnet test or the Rising test. What you tell is uh, one way is you can just tell the patient to. Uh, try to touch into his chest or to lift his uh, shoulders and head by keeping his hand above over his chest like this you can tell the patient to lift up or else tell the patient to do a valsalva maneuver uh, in case if there is swelling in the later side so what happened uh, this carnet test is done for the midline swelling not for the gallbladder for the later side you can tell the patient to do the valsalva maneuver for the upper abdomen swelling when the patient raises his head or shoulder if the swelling disappear or the prom if the if the swelling become less prominent then the swelling can be is intra abdominal if the swelling becomes more prominent then the swelling is parietal so this carnet test will help you to differentiate whether this is the intra abdominal swelling or the parietal swelling in the parietal swelling it will increase it will diminish in case it is intra abdominal swelling while the patient lifts his head it's for the upper same same test can be done for the lower swelling if the swelling is below the uh, umbilicus or of, or the lower abdomen then that time you ask the patient to lift the head uh, if the swelling is below the umbilicus you tell that time you tell the patient to lift his legs if the swelling increases same it is parietal if it decreases or diminishes it means it's intra abdominal swelling so to assess whether the swelling is retroperitoneal or intraperitoneal or intraabdominal, what do we do is generally in books you will see there is something called knee elbow position which you tell and people do not like it because it's very disrespectful for the pay for the person to be in knee elbow position. If the swelling aggravates or comes down, then the swelling is intraabdominal. If the swelling aggravates, if the swelling diminishes then you can say is as retroperitoneal because retro retroperitoneal objects will never come or the masses will never come um, ahead so but so there is another way don't do knee elbow position this is what is called knee elbow position now what is you can do is lateral exaggerated position in that position what happens in lateral exaggerated patient is lying down like this you tell the patient move to one side completely like lateral the hyper extended toward the one side and then you see whether the swelling is increasing or not that is a better way of doing that test when we uh, we are seeing carnet test or rising test or valsalva maneuver or in for children you can make them little bit cry so that time what happens is abdominal muscle are becoming taut if the abdominal muscles are becoming taut means rectus muscles are becoming tightened and when abdomen muscles are becoming swelling tight, when the abdomen muscles are becoming tight, so any swelling above the or the parietal swelling will become very prominent. And where the swellings below it, below the rectus muscle or your intra abdomen swelling will become less prominent. So this is the logic for doing all this test. Uh, then coming up to the uh, swellings, you have to like mention the site, size, shape, surface, regular or irregular extended margin consistency movement with respiration and pulsation over the swelling now visible lump at the pyloric region in case of newborn could be due to your congenital pyloric stenosis i already told if there is a in in case of newborn in case of adult in case of newborn you have to think of congenital pyloric stenosis if there is a epigastric swelling in case of adult you can think of carcinoma of stomach and it is very much irregular it will be hard to vary degree of mobility uh, absence of lump if they if in case like you do not find any mass in the epigastric lesion that does not exclude carcinoma of stomach in case of leaky ulcer the mass would be firm less mobile and less mobile and it would be very much tender tenderness will be higher 
consistency in abdominal swelling generally we cannot comment uh, on whether it is cystic or not or solid because we are not able to fix it so generally avoid this mentioning uh, consistency in case of abdomen swelling because consist for consistency you need to fix the swelling and then look whether it's fluctuating or not whether it is solid or not so most of the examiner do not like when you talk about consistency especially in a abdomen swelling for intrinsic mobility only with mass less than 10 centimeter you can hold this mass uh, to assess its intrinsic mobility when, when the mass is small whether the mass is expensile or transmitted pulsile so what do you do is so you over the mass you keep the two finger if it lifts and separates the two finger then it's expensile pulse if it only lifts the finger then it's due to the transmitted pulse so transmitted is could be due to the enlarged organ over the artery so the hair is just to differentiate between a pancreatic mass and a stomach mass so mass of the stomach will be intraperitoneal moves with respiration of pancreas it will be retroperitoneal does not move with the uh, respiration it will be immobile does not fall forward in knee or elbow position or lateral exaggerated position mass will fall uh, fall forward in knee elbow position or lateral exaggerated position because it's intra-abdominal and when you percuss over the stomach uh, stomach mass it will be impaired because the growth is present but in case of uh, mass which is originating from the pancreas there will be stomach and intestine which are hollow so hollow organs will always make a resonant sound succussion uh, splash done before giving the water when you in the inspection i told you not to look for visible gastric peristalsis before that you do this you can do the succussion splash what you can do is catch a fold of skin over the epigastric region and shake you can hear the splashing sound or gargle without the stethoscope so it can be done seen in gastric outlet obstruction goo then you have to do the examination if there is a mass there will be impaired resonance especially the gastric mass so in the abdomen they might ask you something about called trop space for the trop space uh, sixth fourth fifth sixth sixth rib in the mid clavicle line and anterior ex middle axillary line ninth rib seven 8, 9. So this area is the trop space. Okay. So in trop space you have to focus. If it is dull then you have to suspect if there is a malignancy of stomach or there is a splenomegaly. Because trop space contains the fundus of the stomach. Bowel sound you have to escalate uh, around the umbilicus or spinal umbilical line for 2 to 3 uh, minutes. Then you can do the ascalto scraping to determine the size of stomach. This is important. Uh, you can do in ascalto scraping is keep the bell of your stethoscope in the epigastric region and scrape from inward to outward. So like this, whenever you see the note in the change of the frequency of sound, this you can help to outline the stomach. Then in parietal examination, you can look for tenderness in the rectovesical pouch, which could be due to in perforated peptic ulcer or look at the bloomer shelf. Is there any malignant deposit in the rectovesical pouch or not, which is also called pouch of Douglas. Do the examination of other system in RS, it could be due to pleurofusion, lung mats or TV. Then you can mention your differential diagnosis, which could be gastric outlet obstruction with a palpable epigastric mass due to gastric carcinoma. Or else it could be gastric outlet obstruction without a palpable mass. It could be due to the chronic duodenal ulcer. So like this you can mention. Then which is a very common viva question is, what are your differential diagnosis for gastric outlet obstruction? Could be the duodenal ulcer with secretization or prepyloric ulcer antral growth of obstruction, carcinoma of pancreas, annular pancreas, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, duodenal ulcer in children, duodenal atresia in children, chronic pancreatitis, gastric lymphoma, superior mesenteric artery syndrome which is Wilkie's syndrome. What happens is Wilkie's disease is common in tall and thin people. It is due to the compression of duodenum uh, between vertebral column and superior mesenteric artery at the third part of the duodenum. And then trichobezar with the psychogenic consumption of hair which causes obstruction of the uh, GI gastric intestinal tract or it could be phytobezar with the psychogenic vegetable consumption and causes this. So overall you have to mention it's a gastric outlet obstruction. The silent feature is visible gastric peristalsis which is very very important. 
you can confirm with the succussion splash there is a distended abdomen distended stomach on a skeletal scraping gastric outlet obstruction will have vomiting without break not more than it within on 24 hours 12 to 24 hours they will be a vomiting they might ask you what a different differential diagnosis in form of what are the malignant lesions you are thinking what is the benign lesions you are thinking in benign lesions you can think of uh, duodenal ulcer or gastric ulcers so if there is any abdomen lump with pain and abdomen distension so you can think of hepatocellular carcinoma lymphoma of gi tract hydatid cyst they grow very slow uh, there will be history of more than one year or something like that of just tumors cystic tumors of pancreas ascites due to malignancy so all this should be a differential diagnosis in case of um, then next this is the most common thing they will ask you what are your investigations so hemoglobin you have to see in case of bleeding how whether the patient will need a blood transfusion or not electrolyte and so what happens in case of gastric outlet outlet obstruction is there is a metabolic acid alkalosis what happens uh, bicarbonates are excreted in urine along with sodium which results in hypokalemia and potassium loss is replaced by your proton h plus loss so what happens is this causes paradoxical renal aciduria so there is a metabolic alkalosis and re paradoxical renal aciduria so this is also a co very common viva question how this paradoxical renal aciduria happens uh, they might ask you regarding the endoscopy uh, benign ulcers in endoscopy will be uh, generally convergence of mucosal uh, fold will be there they will be punched out peristalsis will be seen in case of malignant uh, ulcers or malignancy there will be loss of convergence of mucosal fold they will be everted edges uh, the size would be more than 2 cm they would be slugging at the floor slug would, slug would be there at the floor there will be no peristalsis so this is how you differentiate linitis plastica lp there will be loss of rugae there will be absence of distension absence of distension and people take well biopsy like uh, what happen in well biopsies repeatedly from the same side you keep on digging and taking the sample till the sub mucosa comes in the sample varium meal in the same for the linitis plastica it will give you a leather bottle appearance this is also a very mcq question also and especially in viva they ask you leather bottle appearance in varium meal for linitis plastica endoscopy they will have a disadvantage like it cannot diagnose something of your gist tumors or any lymphoma or any carcinoid for them endoscopy is not so useful in endoscopy you can do uh, the test for h pylori you can do a rapid urease test on biopsy kit But another test for h pylori yeah h pylori is one of the another reason for the carcinoma so they might ask you a lot about it there is c13 breath testing there is uh, how do you stain it staining is through silver staining there is also elisa test for h pylori they might ask you what is the normal stomach emptying time so normal emptying time of the stomach is 3 to 4 hours anything more than 6 hours can be considered as hypotonia anything more than 12 hours in organ then you can call it as organis pyloric stenosis then barium meal you can look at the deformed duodenal cap stasis delayed emptying time filling defect arc class contracture and uh, for the ultrasound look ultrasound can tell you about liver metastasis ascetic fluid krukenberg tumor where there is a metastasis to ovary pelvis deposit is there 
these are the common viva questions like how what is the further investigation will you do how will you manage this patient what type of surgery uh, anatomy and blood supply of stomach in and out they will ask you especially about the gi also what is the length of gi tract then is your jolling jolling allison syndrome in this what happens is there is severe peptic ulcer disease there is abdomen severe abdomen pain plus hyper secretion of the acid is there and there is non islet cell tumor of pancreas so this is the thing which will hint you towards jollinger ellison syndrome they might ask you what are the pre malignant lesions of gastric cancer staging of the gastric carcinoma treatment surgery h pylori they might ask you what is the protocol for management of h pylori and other surgeries or other carcinomas they will ask so read well guys see you guys in the next video follow on facebook instagram twitter and any i'm everywhere as ankit sunia so see you guys in the next video tata bye bye